long history of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people in Canada. We recognize their stewardship of the land. May we all live with respect on this land and together live in peace and friendship. So I'm going to turn it over to Nina and let's hear what she has to say about water and wetlands. All right, thanks so much, Denise. All right, my friends. So today we are going to be talking about water and wetlands. We're going to talk a little bit, get us started talking about where all the water is in the world. Can we drink all the water in the world? And then we're going to take a little bit of a deep dive into wetlands and look at a few of the different animals that make their homes there. So the first thing we're going to talk about is how much water is in the world. So right here in my hand, I have an apple. Now, if we think of this apple as the whole world, the earth is covered in three quarters of water. So I cut my apple into fours. So three of those fours are all water. Just one quarter of the earth is land. Now, when we think about just that water, so 75%-ish of the world is water, how much of that now, where do we find all that water? A lot of that water is in the oceans, and ocean water is salty. Now, for us as humans and a lot of other animals, they can't drink salt water. So we need to think about how much fresh water or not salty water is in the world. So right here with me, um, I have a thousand milliliters, which is one liter of water. So I'm going to pour that into my bowl here. So if we think of all the water in the world, this is how much water is in the world. That's a lot of water. You might be thinking, great, lots of water, cool. But how much of this water is fresh water? So when I think about fresh water, we will take two teaspoons. So here's one teaspoon, I'm gonna put it in there. And I'm gonna put another teaspoon in here. And that, my friends, just this little bit of water in this tiny jar Compared to this big bowl of water right here, this is all the fresh water that there is in the world. Now I'm gonna share my screen with you so we can see some other visuals um, and get started with the presentation. So where else do we find water in the world? We find water, like I said, we find lots and lots of water in the oceans. We also find water in lakes and wetlands. We're gonna talk specifically about wetlands today. We find water in rivers. And in fact, on this picture of the globe, you can see a little bit of the Amazon River, one of the biggest rivers in the whole world. We also find water in glaciers, so that is a frozen water, either that might be located in the Antarctic, which is at the south of the globe, or in the north, in the Arctic, um, or sometimes on mountains. And we find lots of water in clouds as well. So all of these swirly bits of water, uh, or swirly white bits on top here, those are all clouds, and clouds are made of water vapor. Um, so there's lots of water in the clouds. And finally, we also have water that is stored underneath the ground. So for those of you who might have a well at home um, or live in a town that uses well water, your water comes from underneath the ground. Now, how does water get from place to place? Water moves in a cycle and we call it the water cycle. And just like most cycles, there's no real start and no real end, uh, but we're gonna jump right in um, with evaporation. So when water gets nice and warm, it's going to go from a liquid to a gas and it's gonna go up into the atmosphere where, or up way in the sky, where it's going to cool down and form clouds. And that process of cooling down is called condensation. Eventually, those clouds are going to become really heavy, and all of that water that is in those clouds is going to come down 
to the earth through precipitation. And that precipitation could be snow, it could be rain, it could be hail, it could be that slush that comes from the sky that's not quite rain and not quite snow. So for precipitation, our water is going from a liquid, is either going to be a liquid or a solid as it comes down to earth. Evaporation is when water goes from a liquid state to a gas state. And then finally, when water condenses, it goes from that gas state to a liquid state. So all of that liquid is stored in the clouds high above the earth. All right, friends, so let's talk about wetlands. Now, wetlands are really just any area of land that is wet. Pretty simple definition. And wetlands can look lots of different ways, and there's wetlands, different types of wetlands all over the world. Um, we're gonna talk specifically about two types of wetlands today because where Denise and I work in the Sable River watershed and the Bayfield River watershed, we have two main types of wetlands, and those are swamps and marshes. So swamps are a special type of wetland um, that has trees, that have trees growing in them. So they, you can think of them as a really wet woods or a wet forest. And sometimes the water will be there year round and sometimes it won't be. It kind of depends on the swamp and how big it is. But typically at minimum, you're gonna see water on the ground just like you can see in this picture right here from about late winter. So sort of end of February, early March, right through to early summer. So about June, maybe into July, kind of depends on how hot it's been. Now, now wetland, now marsh, oh, swamps, swamps, this is a picture taken in the fall or the winter. So it doesn't look very green. And you might think, Nina, all of those trees are dead. In fact, they're not dead. This picture was just taken in the fall, but it gives us a nice overview of how far the water goes in the swamp. Now swamps in the summertime could look like this. Lots and lots of trees growing very, very green. We've got some cool plants here growing on the ground. And this area right here where we don't see a whole lot of things growing, that's the area that is probably wet throughout most of the year. Now the other type of wetlands that we have here um, in the ABCA's area are marshes. And marshes are sort of like an open pond uh, that happen in a field. And mostly the vegetation all around that marsh is gonna be um, non-woody plants. So when I say non-woody plants, it just means that there aren't any trees and there aren't any shrubs. There's gonna be lots of grasses and lots of flowers and lots of sedges and lots of other aquatic plants. So who lives in a wetland? Now the first animal that we are gonna look at is a mammal. And for us to know that something is a mammal, it's going to have some fur. So when we look at a little part of this picture, we know that this animal has some fur. Our next picture gives you another clue. Can you guess who this animal is? You can write it in the chat or you can turn on your mic and shout it out. Um, mammals also drink milk from their mothers. Can you think of a mammal? Who might this be with these little claws like this? Our fourth picture gives us who is a big round mammal that might live in a wetland. All right, final picture. Oh, look at those webbed feet and that big flat tail. It's a beaver. Beavers make their homes in wetlands. Now, what makes beavers so well adapted or suited to the wetlands that they live in? Number one, beaver's teeth never stop growing. They need to chew on wood. And in fact, wood is their main food source. In fact, their only food source. That is what beavers eat. They eat wood. Um, and they have a really cool thing where their lips are actually behind their teeth so that when they're under the water, they can still chew on that wood without getting too much water in their mouths. Because just like us, they breathe air and can't breathe underwater. 
they have these awesome webbed feet and this big flat tail, which makes them amazing swimmers. They also have a really cool waterproof fur coat. And in fact, they produce a special oil that they help sort of spread throughout their whole body that prevents the water from getting right up to its skin, which is especially important at this time of year in the winter, because if that water got right up to the skin, then the beaver would be too cold. So that waterproof coat helps keep them warm, even when they're swimming in the wintertime. And then finally, they have a really cool double eyelid. So their second eyelid, so when we close our eyes as humans, we can't see through our eyelids, right? But beavers, their second eyelid is see-through so that their eye is protected when they're swimming and they can still see when they're underwater. Now, with me right here, I have a beaver skull. So this is something that is pretty cool and gives us the opportunity to check out their big, long, sharp teeth. Now, these front teeth right here are super awesome and they are what the beaver will use to uh, chop down a tree in order to take it some food. But if we look at those back teeth right there, you'll notice that they're really flat. And if we look at the top of them, they have lots of ridges in them. And these teeth are great for grinding up that plant matter that they eat. And we can also tell from this skull, this is where the beaver's eye would be. So their eyes aren't particularly big. And then the rest of their skull, this is where their brain would go. The brain isn't also that big. Another fun fact about beavers, is that they are the largest rodent in Canada and the second largest rodent in the whole world. The first, uh, the largest rodent in the world is actually a tapir. I like it's a capybara. All right, so let's move on, my friends. So we are going to think about some birds that live in wetlands. Now you might think. Okay, I've seen birds in the water before. Now this is a special bird that I want to tell you about that doesn't stay here year round. So right now we won't be able to see this bird because it's winter time, but it should be back probably around April. So can you think of a bird that lives in a wetland that has pretty long legs? Hmm. Can you think of a bird that has sort of this long body and is this nice blue gray color? How about now? Look at this big head and long pointy beak. It's a great blue heron. Now we know the great blue heron is a bird uh, because it has these really cool feathers. It's got a beak and we know that great blue herons lay eggs. So what are some other cool adaptations about the great blue heron? Great blue herons are incredibly fast. Their neck and very sharp beak allow them to watch quietly in the water and then lightning fast stab a fish or a frog that they want to eat. They also have this really cool sort of these ruffly feathers on their chest that produce this special powder that they can spread over the rest of their body, which helps keep slime from ponds um, and other things away from their skin. So just kind of like the beaver, they have a built-in special protection to keep them protected from the water that they spend most of their time in. They also have hollow bones, which makes them very light which explains why such a big animal could still fly. In fact, if you were to weigh a great blue heron, it would only weigh about five pounds. That huge bird only weighs five pounds. Isn't that crazy? So I also, here with me, I have a couple of great blue heron bones. So you can see how thin and how light they are. And you can also take a look, this one right here is part of its jaw. This is the bottom beak, and then up here is the top beak. We'll just use the top beak for now. 
Uh, and you can actually see how pointed and sharp, I think we're missing a little bit of an end there, um, but this beak would be very sharp and pointy, allowing them to get that food that they want. And you'll also notice the hole right here. So this hole would help them with their sense of smell um, and also keeps their beak nice and light. They are also have excellent night vision. All right, my friends. So who else makes their home in a wetland? Reptiles make their home in wetlands. So can you think of a reptile that might have dinosaur looking feet? Hmm. Can you think of a reptile that has a big shell? Oh, and take a look. This is our friend, the snapping turtle. Snapping turtles are the biggest turtle we have here in Ontario. It can get up to half a meter long its shell. That's a pretty big turtle. So what are some things that make snapping turtles so special and so neat? We can see from this picture that snapping turtles have amazing claws. Um, that they will dig in the dirt at the bottom of a pond or wetland to find some of the food that they like to eat. And snapping turtles, in fact, 90%, so almost their whole diet is made up of dead things. So snapping turtles play a really important role in keeping our wetlands nice and clean. They also have their snapping turtles, right? They have a snapping feature. That is one of their adaptations. So snapping turtles don't really have teeth, um, but they do have strong, powerful jaws um, that they'll snap at things when uh, they get too close to them, has a way to protect themselves. Because in fact, even though the snapping turtle shell is so big, it's not big enough for the turtle to go all the way inside of their shells like some of the other turtles that we're going to carry. And they also have a pretty long and flexible neck, which allows them to smell and see and find lots of food for them to eat. I forgot to animate this one. All right, does anyone know who this animal is? Oh, you know what? I'm actually going to show you our snapping turtle shell before we move on to our amphibian friends that are going show. So this is an example of a snapping turtle shell. You can see just by me holding it, and it doesn't really fit in the screen with me, but it's a pretty big shell. They are a pretty big animal. In fact, if you were to count all of these little squares that you see on the turtle, there are about thir there are 13 of them. And that's the same for every turtle that we find around here. And in fact, in traditional uh, First Nation cultures, especially the Anishinaabek from the area where we are, they said that these 13 spaces represented the 13 moons that we have in a year, which is pretty cool. All right, so our next animal is an amphibian. So how do amphibians and reptiles differ? So reptiles, they tend to have dry, scaly skin. They, even turtles spend most of their time in the water, they lay their eggs on the land. Now our amphibian friends, you can even tell by this picture right here, they have smooth, wet skin. Um, they might even be a little bit slimy if you were to pick them up. And that's because they actually breathe through their skin, which is something that is really cool about our amphibian friends. Um, and they will lay their eggs in the water. And in fact, they will spend part of their early life in the water. All right, does anyone know who this animal is? It's a spotted salamander. So spotted salamanders will lay their eggs in the water and then when those eggs hatch, the juvenile, kind of like a tadpole, hatches and they have external gills. 
So unlike the adult that breathes through their skin, the young of the spotted salamander will breathe through these feathery gills. And they do have little legs right here, but their legs aren't quite as strong as the adult legs. And then eventually they'll get big enough, their legs will get strong enough that these gills will go back inside their body and they will crawl up on land to begin their adult part of their life. So what are some other cool adaptations of the spotted salamander? So spotted salamanders have a stinky toxic liquid in their tails and sort of in their rear end that they might spray, um, not really spray, but omit, emit, uh, to help keep them safe from predators. They also have a sticky tongue, which is gonna help them uh, collect all of those earthworms and little bugs that live under logs. Um, that they want to eat help them get that food successfully. And then finally, they have pretty strong legs so that they can actually run really fast. If you were to ever find, if you ever turn over a log and you find a salamander, it might be gone just like that. Now, when we think of our um, amphibians, we like to think that they have sort of two lives, their first life in the water and then their second life on the land. So when amphibians lay their eggs, they might lay a mass of eggs that look a little bit like this. So sometimes they'll be in like long strings, sometimes they'll be a mass of eggs, and it depends on which amphibian we're talking about, whether we're talking about frogs or salamanders. Now after that egg hatches, now I only have with me a frog life cycle, so if you lay me that, that, that looks like a cat thing that you just showed the curly gills. That's okay. Yeah, they have a very similar life cycle. So once a frog egg hatches, we get this little tadpole. So a tadpole has a nice round head and this flat long tail that helps them maneuver through the water. Now eventually that um, tadpole is going to start growing legs. And for frogs, we like to call them froglets because they're not quite frogs. They've still got this cool tail, but they also have little tiny legs and they're starting to look more like a frog. Their head isn't quite as pointed as it was. And then the adults might look something like this. It kind of depends on the frog. There's lots of different frogs that live here in Ontario. Um, and they will spend part of their time in the water and part of their time out of the water. And then eventually the cycle will begin again when the adult frog lays eggs in the water. All right, so let's meet uh, an insect that spends most of their time in the water. Now, I want you to think about who this might be, and we'll talk about what makes an insect an insect in a second. So this insect has a really big eyes. Hmm. This insect, like all insects, has six legs. And this insect has a long sort of um, abdomen here with maybe a little bit of a tail or kind of like a forked point at the end. Any ideas? In fact, it is a baby dragonfly. And the cool word for a baby dragonfly is a nymph. So eventually this dragonfly will turn in, this nymph will turn into a full grown adult dragonfly. But dragonflies lay their eggs in the water and their nymphs can spend up to 10 years in the water before they are ready to become an adult. Now, what are some cool features of a dragonfly? They have these really cool hinged jaws that make them amazing hunters. So dragonflies, the adults, um, are some of the coolest flyers and the, some of the most vicious hunters in the insect world. And their nymphs are the same, other than the flying part. Um, the hinge jaw actually sort of rests underneath where their mouth is, and then when they see a prey, it'll shoot out and scoop that prey into their mouth for them to eat. Just really cool. They have these huge eyes because they live underwater and need to be able to see, so they rely on their sight to hunt 
so that they're not wasting energy when they're using that hinge jaw to try and get some food. Another really cool thing about a dragonfly nymph is that their gills, how they breathe, are located near their butt. Um, and in fact, they're able to push water out of their gills really fast, which allows them to shoot away from any predators that might want to eat them, which is one of the neatest things about the dragonfly nymphs that I can think of. Now, when a dragonfly is ready to emerge to adulthood, it will crawl up on the land sort of sit on a piece of grass or something near the edge of a wetland. In fact, if you're really lucky and you're paying good amount of attention, you might be able to find one of these casings. Because in fact, just like a butterfly that emerges from a cocoon, um, the drag, the adult dragonfly will emerge from its nymph casing. And it will split sort of right behind the head there. You can see right here. It'll split right where that head is and everything will emerge from that spot. Now, if you noticed, I may have crushed that a little bit. Those are very fragile. So if you do find them in nature, just be gentle while you're exploring. All right, so we talked a lot about the animals that live in wetlands. Um, we need to think, about the plants that make wetlands so special. Now, the first one that we're going to talk about is a silver maple tree. Now, where we live in Huron County, Denise and I, um, there are lots of silver maple trees. There is something that farmers like to plant on the edge of their fields. They're planted for shade, planted for beauty. There's lots of reasons you might plant them. Um, so they're not always, they're not only found in wetlands, but uh, they are capable of growing in wetlands. Do you remember what kind of wetlands we find trees in? It's a swamp. So we, if we come across a swamp, we might find lots of silver maple trees. So silver maple trees, they have sort of this shaggy gray bark that tells, that, that tells us that it is a silver maple. When the tree has leaves, it has looks like a maple. We've got these three things right here. We've got some really deep lobes in there as well. And these really deep lobes are kind of the, the key thing for identifying a silver maple from its leaf. And then in the fall, a silver maple will turn yellow. So some of the things that make silver maples grow really well in wetlands is that they can grow in the shade. So when a silver maple drops keys, just like any maple tree does, those keys or those seeds are able to grow um, in the shade of another tree. It can survive, the seedling or the seed itself can survive for up to two months fully submerged underwater. Not all trees can do that. Some trees, if you, if, if you get them wet for too long, or get their roots wet for too long, they're gonna be like, nope, not for me, and then they'll die. Um, so that is one other thing that makes silver maple trees really special. And then they do well in swamps because they grow really fast, which is another reason why we see a lot of them planted um, in farms, in cities, really everywhere. People like trees that grow fast because they provide shade uh, a little bit faster than if you planted a silver growing tree. Um, and then finally, we have the cardinal flower and the turtle head flower. So these are both flowers that we would find in marshes because these flowers like to have a full sun. So some of the cool things about these, so cardinal flowers, if you notice, if you look at these flowers right here, they are very long and skinny. And because they're so long and thin, um, our typical insect pollinators that we think of, like bees and wasps and beetles, um, they have a hard time getting the nectar from the bottom that they're trying to collect. So the cardinal flower actually relies on hummingbirds to pollinate it because hummingbirds with their long beak 
um, the, that long beak will help them get deep down into the flower to get that nectar. Now the turtle head flowers, if you look closely and use your imagination, you can see that these flowers look kind of like the head of a turtle. Now both of these flowers will only grow in wet or more moist soil. So they won't grow where it's dry. In fact, they need it to be wet in order for them to thrive. If it gets too wet or, or too dry, um, or it's too dry for too long, then these flowers could die. So we talked a lot about wetlands. We talked about who lives in them, what plants live in them. And we can see it just from the amazing diversity of just those few things that we looked at today, there are so many reasons to love our wetlands and to protect our wetlands. So what are some things that you can do to help protect our wetlands? You can conserve water. So this doesn't mean that you shouldn't drink the water that you need to drink. Um, this means things like making sure that you turn off the tap when you're brushing your teeth, taking shorter showers, um, things like that, making sure that you turn off the tap nice and tight when you're done with it so that it doesn't drip. Those are all ways of conserving water. Make sure you don't waste food. So um, I like to say, take what you need and eat what you take. So making sure that when you put the food on your plate that you're gonna eat all of it because it takes a lot of water to grow food um, or to keep the animals healthy that we eat. Make sure that you are not littering. So if you go for a walk, you're going to go play in the park. Um, you want to take a snack with you. That's awesome. But make sure that you take that garbage home with you or make sure that you put it in the right place. Make sure that if you have a pet like a dog, that you are picking up after that pet. So when your dog poops, you want to make sure that you are scooping that poop and putting that poop in the garbage, just like the packaging for the granola bar you might eat for your snack while you're out. So if you learned something through this presentation or you do some more research on wetlands because you are fascinated by who lives there and how cool they are, um, tell others about wetlands. Tell them how cool they are. You can do that through a song, you can do it through a story, you can do it through a picture. There's so many ways of telling other people about wetlands. You can go to visit a wetland, but make sure you stay on the trail. Some great wetlands in the Huron County area that you could take a stroll around with some nice paths include um, Hullet Marsh, which is just north of Clinton. Um, Hay Swamp doesn't really have a whole lot of paths, but it is a pretty cool swamp in our area. When you are visiting a wetland, make sure that you are leaving um, any flowers or plants that you find there and any animals you find in the wild. It can be very tempting when you find a cute turtle or a cute salamander to want to take it home and take care of it, but they are very good at taking care of themselves and they need to stay in nature because they do more than we know. They are an important part of the whole cycle of life. You could grow a garden at home. So think about uh, growing some native wildflowers. If you have a really wet patch in your backyard, maybe you want to get some um, wetland wildflowers like the cardinal flower that turtle head to grow in your own yard, which could be super cool. I bet none of your other neighbors have those flowers. Um, you could also think about growing your own vegetables. It's a great way to reduce your impact on the environment by growing your own. And then finally, you could build and put up a nest box. So there's lots of different kinds of nest boxes and it kind of depends on who you're trying to attract, what kind of nest box you can build, but you could build a box for a bat to roost in. If you were to put it up now, you would definitely need to wait until the summer for about to start using it. Um, you could build a box for a wood duck, especially if you have a wetland on your property. Now, if you build a box for a wood duck, the holes of the wood duck, the size of the hole the wood duck likes 
It's also the same size that a screech owl uses. So maybe you'll get a screech owl, which is also really cool. And sometimes you'll get a screech owl in the wintertime when they nest, and then you get a wood duck in the summertime when they nest, which is awesome. Um, you could put up a nest box for um, a bluebird. There's a lots and lots of options um, for you, and you can do a little bit of research to figure out what kind of animal you want to attract, what kind of bird nest box you want to put up, um, and then build the box appropriately for that bird. All right, so thank you so much for joining me today for this presentation on wetlands and water and who lives in wetlands. If you want to learn a little bit more about this Lunch and Learn series that we have just finished, all of our previous presentations are on the ABCA's YouTube channel. If you have any questions about wetlands or water, or you want to share a story, a song, a drawing, you can send me an email at nsampson at abca.ca. And then you can also join us in two Fridays on February 26th for our first in our next Lunch and Learn series on mammals. Well, I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. And thank you so much for joining us. And we will, is there anyone who has any questions? Yeah, I hadn't noticed any questions in the, in the chat box, but uh, I, I think everyone's learned a lot today. And thank you for sharing all of that knowledge and stuff about creatures and plants and animals and how we can protect the wetlands. Um, so thanks again. And yes, we look forward to the next presentation as well on mammals. See you on the All right. Enjoy your long weekend, everyone. Bye. Bye.